This is the week number three for our class on New Testament theology. And I want to begin uh, by first of all asking if you have any questions about the, the paper guidelines or the, the due date. All right. Well, if there are no other questions, if there are no questions, uh, then I'm going to begin with a prayer. Dear loving God, we thank you for another opportunity we have today to study your word. We pray that this time will be a, a very helpful, informative, inspiring time for each student. I pray that, that the learning that takes place this morning will be helpful in their own personal lives and very helpful for them as they develop as theologians and future preachers and teachers. And uh, we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, please open your guide to week number three. And today we're going to look at the Pauline theology in the context of two particular letters, Romans and Philippians. Now we've already had the overview of Paul's theology. And now we're going to look in more depth at two letters and what we find in those two letters. And this will serve to reinforce what we talked about last time, but also to give some more nuance, to give some more understanding, some greater explanation for some of his thinking. There's one more thing about today. I want you to see that these two letters are written to two very different contexts. And as a result, the language is different. And so this provides a bit of a case study for us in, in doing contextual theology. Now that's not the main point today, but I want you to notice that. And we'll talk about that especially the second hour when we get to Philippians. All right, so now if we look up on the screen, you can see the, uh, the map. And this time I've added the fourth journey, well not, not the fourth journey, but at least his journey to Rome. And so you can see up here uh, that uh, these are the first three journeys, that we, missionary journeys that we pointed out last time. But sometime, well, we think maybe 61 or 62 AD, Paul left Jerusalem. That's the green line here. He left Jerusalem and he went up along this route here and eventually uh, made his way all the way to Rome. A couple of years before that, and again we're not sure of the date, sometime in the 50s, maybe 58 uh, AD, while he was in uh, perhaps Corinth, and we can find that here, here's Athens and uh, some, some of the other cities here, uh, perhaps that's where he was when he wrote, or where he was when he wrote the, the letter to the Romans. So again, let me restate that. In about 58 AD, here in Corinth, he wrote a letter to the Romans before he had ever visited there. But then a few years later, he was, after he was arrested in Jerusalem, and he appealed to the emperor, he was taken to Rome, uh, where either he, he died there at that time, or he was released, did another journey, and then died there a few years later. Okay, so that's, that's historical context and the geographical context for us. So now let's focus on the book of Romans. Now I'm going to take a look at, I'm going to be reading from your guide. The book of Romans, written in about AD 57 or 58, is the classic New Testament text on Christian theology. Some parts are not easy to understand. Other parts may be difficult to accept. Nevertheless, two theological truths stand out among many. Our spiritual hope rests in the magnificent grace of God. And number two, God's work in our life makes it possible for us to become the people of God 
that were the people that God always intended that we would be. All right? So let me rephrase that because it's very important for your theology. Our salvation depends upon the grace of God, what God does for us. And that's the historical Protestant point of view from Martin Luther on. That has been the emphasis in the Protestant and Baptist churches. God does the work for us. Through Christ on the cross and by His grace, we are forgiven. But the second truth is also very important in Pauline theology. And that is that, that God's grace is an active power at work in your lives, in the lives of those who, who believe. And that's principally through the Holy Spirit. And, and as the Holy Spirit works in your life, you and I can actually be transformed. We can change, we can grow, we can develop, we can exercise our spiritual gifts, we can be used by God to make a difference in this world. Not by sheer human power, but by God's power working through us. So please, in your theology, hold these two points together. They belong together. And don't make them one point uh, be because that's confusing. But hold them as two points, but two points that belong together. In the first 11 chapters, most of the teaching is doctrine or theology without practical application or instruction, with, with some exceptions. However, Paul's teachings in Romans have huge implications for how we view ourselves, how we view God, how we relate to God, how we understand our purpose for life, and ultimately how we live. But we must be willing to spend a lot of time thinking about concepts and reflecting on possible implications before he gets to the practical teaching, also known as paranesis in Romans 12 through 15. Okay, today we're going to then look at the book of Romans uh, by categories rather than going through uh, the text chapter by chapter, which is the best way to do it. Uh, but because of time, we're forced to just identify a few important theological categories and then we're going to highlight some texts. But for this class, I remind you that one of your assignments is to read through the book of Romans from the beginning to the end. And that's really the best way, maybe the only way, to understand how Paul's thought uh, flows and how it develops. Uh, truly, Romans is one of my favorite books. Uh, has become one of my favorite books now that I understand it better. It was more difficult when I was your age, first in school, because there's so many concepts there. But it's rich and it's deep. And it's the longest of Paul's letters. And it's placed in that prominent place as the, the first place among all of the epistles. So we'll start by focusing on soteriology. What does soteriology mean? The study of salvation. Okay, great, exactly. So traditional reformed, by which we mean the Lutherans, Presbyterians, and many Baptists, the traditional reformed position is that justification comes to us by grace through faith apart from works of the law. And that idea comes principally from Romans and Galatians in the New Testament. And so I'm going to take you through a, a collection of verses in Romans. So you'll need your Bibles for this. So first of all, let's to open our Bibles to Romans chapter 1. And we're going to look at verses 18 through 32. There's a flow of thinking from point 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 to 5 to 6. Okay. So now, starting Romans 1.18, Paul says, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature 
have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man, and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator, who is forever praised. Amen. Now we'll skip down to 28. Furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They are senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. Okay, now turn to chapter 3, verse 9. He continues to talk about this idea of the sinfulness of the human race, and, then, uh, and, and that includes Jews as well as Gentiles. And then in verse 9, he says, What shall we conclude then? Are we any better? Not at all. We have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are under sin. And now skip down to 21 to 24. But now a righteousness from God apart from the law has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Okay, there's a lot in those verses. But this is the basic point of view of Paul regarding why the world is in the condition that it's in. But surely you've asked the same question. Why is the world such a mess? Why is there so much trouble and problem in this world? Paul's answer is that God created the world good, but human beings refuse to acknowledge God as God. And so instead of worshiping the Creator, they started worshiping the created things. And sometimes that meant they made idols. And so you create, you create a golden idol and you worship it. Sometimes it means you worship the trees and the, and the stones and the birds and the animals. And we see that in different religions, don't we, around us. We have idols and, and, and treating animals like sacred animals and, and things like that. And it's, it says this has been what humans have done. So it's not, it's not that there are those who... Who, who the world is divided up between those who worship God in many different forms and those who don't worship God at all or don't care about religion. That's not true at all. What he's saying is that all people are basically religious. All people are religious. But the fundamental sin of the human race is not not being religious. It's worshiping the wrong thing. That's the wrong thing. That's the problem. It's idolatry, worshiping idols, worshiping animals, worshiping the stars, creation. What's the right attitude towards creation? We're supposed to live in awe of it. We're supposed to praise God for making such a beautiful world. For creating the trees and the fish and the animals and, and creating a life that we can share together. It's a beautiful, wonderful thing. But our praise and our praise belongs to the Creator, not to the created things. 
or to things we create ourselves. All right, so that's what Paul says. And he says, and the result of, of a misplaced worship, or in other words, ignoring the truth about God and instead worshiping the created things, is that God has turned over the human race to, uh, to become more and more depraved. And that's the English word, depraved, D-E-P-R-A-V-E-D, -E -E depraved. It means uh, less and less of what God wants us to be, more and more wicked. And what are the signs of wickedness? Sexual immorality, sexual perversion. And then he gives this whole list in chapter 1. We fight with each other. We hate each other. We hurt each other. We have bad attitudes towards each other. And then not only do we do these things, but as the human race continues to devolve or become more depraved, we actually approve of those people who are doing the wicked things. This is how the human race has continued to deteriorate according to the Apostle Paul. Why does he tell us all that? Because in chapter 3, verse 9, he wants, he summarizes the point he's trying to make. And what is that point? Why does he want to paint this terrible picture of the human race? What is his point? The power of sin. And that we are all under the power of sin. And we're all guilty of sin. We didn't read chapter 2. That was directed towards the, the Jewish people, the Jewish religious people, who might have thought, they might have said, well, yes, Paul, you're right about the Gentiles. They're horrible sinners. But we, we Jews, we're righteous. And that's why he points out, no, you're, you're a sinner too. Even though you know the truth, the Gentiles might not know the truth. But you, you know the truth, you teach the truth, but do you do the truth? Do you follow the truth? And that's a rhetorical way of saying, no, you don't. And so the first three chapters of Romans are intended to build up this, this clear, vivid case that God desires a, a, a righteous relationship with us, but we have ruined it as a human race by our own sinfulness, our arrogance, our rebellion against God. But fortunately, that's not the end of the story, but it's the foundation for the story. And that's point number one. Everyone is a sinner and in need of God's forgiveness. So that leads to point two. The basis for justification is faith in the promises of God. So now let's look at Romans 4. Verses 4 and 5. Here, here Paul is in the midst of an of a argument or discussion about Abraham. And he says, Now when a, a person works, his wages are not credited to him as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the man who does not work, but trusts God, who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited as righteousness. And in verse five, chapter 5, verse 1, he says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? And, and so, these verses fit well with the verses that I've asked you to memorize from Ephesians 2, 8, 9. I just like the way they say it better. He says it better in Ephesians because it's so clear. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And so here the second point is that justification, or, or in other words, being made right in the eyes of God is possible. But it's possible only through faith in God and in God's promises. Point number three is, says, uh, comes from chapter five, verses six and eight. 
6 through 8. Romans 5, beginning in verse 6. Paul says, You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. All right, so the point here in your guide says, God's love was demonstrated concretely in the death of God's Son, Jesus, and the giving of His Holy Spirit. Now, I want to underscore the meaning of this, of this verse that said that God demonstrates His love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Why did he emphasize that, do you think? While, while we were still sinners. So Romans 5, 8 says, I'll read it again. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's the answer. Christ's death for us on the cross is the concrete demonstration of God's love for us. So many times people will say, if you're having a discussion, you know, how do I know God loves me? Well, what's the, what's the proof of that? What's the evidence that God loves me? You know, my father died. My, my village is poor. We have many, many troubles in my life. What, what's the proof that God loves me? Paul would say, it's in Christ's incarnation, life and death, that you know that God loves you. That's Paul's theology. So again, you're going to see, you're going to see every single week this semester, we, we keep coming back to Christ. Because Christ is at the center of Paul's theology. And Christ's death on the cross is not an accident of nature to Paul. It's a demonstration of God's love. It's the way that God provided for our forgiveness. That's Paul's theology. Well, the question I asked you earlier is why does Paul say while we were still sinners, Christ died for us? In other words, at, at the time that we were still sinners, Christ died. Why does he say at the time we were still sinners? What do you think? What is he trying to, to communicate? It's this. You don't deserve God's salvation. You didn't earn God's salvation. I didn't earn God's salvation. I can't earn God's salvation. The early church, or for centuries, and maybe maybe the Catholic Church still says this, Augustine did, the number one sin of human race of the human race is what? Have you heard this? What? Well, the, the sin of, of human being, what's, what's our greatest sin? It's, it's pride. It's pride. We're arrogant. It's like, I'm not going to worship the Creator. I'm going to worship, I'm going to worship a tree. I'm going to worship stones. I'm going to worship a cow. Why? Because I, I have control. I decided what I'm going to worship. Even though I sound religious, the truth is I'm in charge, I'm in control. I worship the Creator, I acknowledge there is a being so much greater than I am to whom I owe my allegiance and my praise and my gratitude. So pride is continually gets in the way of our relationship with God. It interferes with our spirituality, our pride. And so Paul, in these first three, four chapters, is saying you have no, you have nothing to stand on. You cannot go before God and say, I'm better than they are. You should save me. <laughs> I deserve your salvation because look, I'm a good person. No. He says nobody is. And so God, salvation comes to us while we were still sinners, unworthy of God's forgiveness, God's salvation, God's even a relationship with God. 
And furthermore, I think there's a, a psychological benefit. And the psychological benefit to me is it, it helps me to realize that, that God's loved me even when I was rebellious, even when I was prideful, even when I was just uh, trapped in sin. That God's love is so great that it reaches out to me before I reach out to God. Okay, the, the Presbyterians under Calvin have a, have a technical name for that. They call it the prevenient grace. You may have learned that in theology class. It just means that God reached out first. He took the initiative to reach out to us before we reached out to Him. Okay, this is, this is powerful theology. But, but what we're trying to do is help you understand clearly what does Paul, what did Paul think? What does he teach? So that's point three. Let's go to point four. The consequence of human sin is physical and spiritual death. But eternal life is still possible through the gift of Jesus Christ. So now I'm turning your Bible to Romans 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay, again, he wants, he wants to make it clear to everyone that all of us are sinners and all of us deserve death. Uh, I, I bought a DVD player. Okay, do you know what a DVD player is? To watch DVDs. And it's broken. And it can't be fixed. What should I do with that DVD player? Throw it away. <laughs> right? So God creates a human race who rebels against Him, acts sinful, wicked, is, acts disgraceful, does not do what God intends. What should God do with us? Yeah, you, see, you don't think like that, do you? That's a little scary. But I only say that as a way to illustrate what Paul's saying in Romans 6.23. The wages of sin is death. In other words, it, this is what you deserve. Because you're not living the way God wanted you to live. What Paul is saying is, but God still loves us and redeems us through Jesus Christ, through faith in Jesus Christ. All right, this is a hard message, but Paul is trying to eliminate all false pride. He's not trying to crush you or push you down, but he's trying to get rid of your false pride because your false pride, my false pride, interferes with my relationship with God. And so it needs to go. We need to clear it out and to realize that that. The only way we can have a right relationship with God is through by His grace, through faith. And by what God has done for us through Jesus Christ. All right, now point number five. Those who are justified or, sa or saved are those who believe that God raised Jesus from the dead and who confess. That means they acknowledge aloud that Jesus Christ is Lord, meaning ruler of the universe and leader. Let's look over to Romans 10, 9 and 10. Romans 10, 9 and 10. Here, now Paul has been talking about the gospel message and the hope in Christ. But earlier he talks about this, this gift of God is not something that God just gives us and, and, and just notifies us. You know, he doesn't send you you know, a text message on Facebook says, hey, good news, you were saved today. I right? just wanted you to know. Okay, bye. Now, <laughs> our salvation is more dynamic and alive than that. So yes, he, he announces the good news in the gospel. But according to Paul's theology, there, it's this word of God is alive and real. And so when the word is spoken and you hear it, it does something inside of your heart. That's how salvation happens. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's alive. 
It's a, it's a process. And when that word is proclaimed to you and you receive it and believe it, then there's a response that you have to make. And that's what he talks about here. 10, 9, and 10, he says, well, let me back up to verse 8. And what does that word say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith we are proclaiming. That if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. See, theology for Paul is not supposed to be just intellectual. Remember I said that last time? It's not like a philosophy that we just, something we study about or believe in our heads. To really understand Paul's theology, yes, we have to understand it in our heads. But it has to then penetrate our hearts so that it changes what we believe. And it creates a relationship with God that we didn't have before, at least not in the same way. And what, what he says is characteristic of that new relationship is that we're going to believe in Jesus. We're going to believe he is the incarnate son of God. We're going to believe that he died for us. And we're going to believe that, that he is the, the Lord of the universe. And he was raised from the dead and he's the Lord of the universe. We may not understand it. We may not be able to prove it. But we believe it. And we hold on to it. We grab hold of it and say, this is my faith. That's what Paul's saying here in Romans chapter 10. And then in verse, point number 6, broadly speaking, everyone who trusts in God and calls on the name of the Lord Jesus will be saved. So let's read the last three verses in that section. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Verse 12, for there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Here Paul is taking the particularity of the Christian gospel and putting this in the broader world. Paul believes that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so I think here there's, there's this small window of, of, of possibility that people who've never heard about Jesus might be saved. There's this possibility that somebody in some other part of the world who never heard the gospel message might still call out to the Lord God and recognize him for who he is and, 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 and put their faith in him. It's possible, theoretically possible. But that's not, that's not the center of his theology. And so we have to be careful that we don't take, take what's on the outside and move it to the center and take what's in the center and move it to the outside. What's on the outside is that God is at work in the whole world in some mysterious way. What's on the inside is that God provided salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. That's on the inside, I mean, in the center. So for us, as we're preparing and learning theology, for you as students, keep the center the center. Because that's the message you have to proclaim. When you leave here, you don't go out to the villages to proclaim a message about a theoretical possibility on the outside. That's God's business. And I trust God to do the right thing for the person who's never heard about, about, about Jesus. But that's not the message I'm preaching because it's not the center. It's not the message Paul preached. Okay. So this is important for you as you do theological education. To put these different ideas in the right places in your mind and in your practice. So what we have here in these six points is a progression of Paul's theology. Do you see that? Moves from 
We're all sinners. We're rebellious against God. We need forgiveness. God provides forgiveness through Jesus Christ to those who believe in Jesus Christ and confess Jesus Christ with their mouths and believe in their hearts. That's the progression of Romans. That's his soteriology. Now there are some other points, uh, but I want you to get the main point in the center, the main points. What some people call this, and, and you might want to write this in your margin, some people call these six points the Roman road to salvation. Have you heard of that? The Roman, because it's the book of Romans, the Roman road to salvation. You see, when, when you're going out and, and you, you meet a, a, a Buddhist in a tea shop, or you're talking to a young person in a church who, who really doesn't know what to believe about God, or you're talking to somebody, talking to a Hindu who, who believes in a, thousands of gods, you need to know the basic gospel message. And this is, as I said, what some people call the Roman road. In other words, I could sit down with somebody in five minutes and say, well, let me just explain to you the Christian point of view. This is it. Point one, two, three, four, five, six. In five minutes, I can cover that. And almost everybody can understand it. They, they don't believe it. Everybody doesn't believe it. But they can understand it. Last night, I, I attended my first small group meeting for my church. Uh, there were two... Uh, two of the people in the small group are Chinese, uh, but they're here in Myanmar working. Neither one has a father. Both of them have a mother who's Buddhist. I said, well, how, how did you become a Christian? You grew up in a Buddhist family in China. Well, one in China, one in Singapore. He said, well, a friend of mine invited me to a Bible study. And they explained to me about Jesus. And God used that to bring these people to faith in Christ. And their own lives are different. They have hope. They have forgiveness. They have meaning. They have a relationship with God they never had before. I, said, I want you to understand the nature of the gospel. I want you to understand the nature of the gospel, according to Paul. But I also want you to understand the importance of the gospel. It changes people's lives. It gives hope to people. And, that, and as I said just last night, I had two more proofs of that to me. And here they were so far from home with, with parents who don't understand, but they believe, and their life is different because of it. Okay, that's soteriology. Uh, probably the most important thing of Romans. Uh, that, that's usually what's emphasized the most. But of course, there's so much more in Romans. So let's spend a, a few minutes on Christology. According to Paul, Jesus is the Son of God. What does he mean by Son of God? Well, this is debated, but it's at least this. It's a unique identity, a unique relationship to God, and a unique role in the universe. The cosmic Christ of Paul is still connected to the historical Jesus. Let's read Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. Romans 1, 1 through 7. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart from the gospel of God. The gospel he promised beforehand through the prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son who as to his human nature was a descendant of David and who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the son of God by his resurrection from the dead Jesus Christ our Lord through him and for his name's sake we receive grace and apostleship to call people from among all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith. And you also are among those who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints.
Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. And there always is in Paul's beginnings to his letters. Usually in the first three, four, five, six, seven verses, he says something about himself, something about God, something about the people that's going to be very important for what he says later on in his letter. You should always look for that. We call that uh, his rhetorical method for in his writing. It's not verbal rhetoric, but it is written rhetoric. But right now we're just focusing on this idea about Son of God. There have been many different traditions in the early church regarding how and when Jesus became or was recognized as the Son of God because of the various teachings found in the Bible. Again, you may have had this teaching already in, uh, in your theology class or in your introduction to New Testament. I don't know. One, the Son of God existed before the creation, before creation, and was the Word made flesh. That's John chapter 1, verse 14. Two, Jesus was conceived as a result of the Holy Spirit's joining with Mary. That's Luke 135. And then three, Jesus was declared to be God's son at his baptism. That's Mark 1, Matthew and Luke, and even John affirms that that happened. And number four, Jesus Christ was declared or appointed son of God at his resurrection. That's what seems to be implied in Romans 1, 4. It wasn't until his resurrection that he was declared to be the son of God. But, but there are other... Uh, verses such as Galatians 4.14 or excuse me 4.4 where Paul says God sent his son so in other words his son he did believe that Christ was somehow the son of God to be sent from God he did in other words he didn't necessarily wait until he was resurrected and number five Jesus Christ was appointed high priest by God at some point at which God said to Christ Today I have become your father. Yet elsewhere in Hebrews, the author claims that God made the universe through the Son and that the Son is the exact representation of God's being. So what are we supposed to make of all of these different ideas? Well, the early church, the theological councils, Nicaea and Constantinople, they decided to put them all together to come up with the Christology of the early church. And that's what we have in the Nicene Creed. But today, the New Testament scholars try to look more narrowly at each reference to the Son of God to try to understand, were there different traditions, different beliefs about when Jesus became the Son of God? Now, why does it matter? Why does it matter when and how Jesus became the Son of God? It matters because it affects how we view who Jesus was. Because for the Muslims, and the Muslims honor Jesus, but he's a prophet, he's not the Son of God. All right? And other, there are many people in the world that, that have to admit Jesus existed. All right? Of course he existed. I forgot to advance this for you. I'll come back to that. Okay. Um, but the non-believing world, the skeptical world says, you know, Jesus was just a great religious figure. He was a human being. And some people said he's the son of God. Well, maybe that meant he was special to the people. Maybe it meant he had a special role like Old Testament prophets. That's all possible. That's all possible. But if you take the New Testament witness all together, it's not possible. The New Testament witness when taken all together, including the Apostle Paul, is that Jesus was more than just a great teacher or a great prophet or even a especially empowered servant of God. He had some kind of relationship with God that no one else has ever had or ever will have in the same way. And the only way to really describe what that relationship is is to call him the Son of God who has this, this relationship with God that's, that's so close that ultimately the church called him God or part of God 
Okay, so that's, uh, and so you see here in the guide, what I wrote here, historically the Son of God designation for Jesus denoted his divine nature, or simply his special status conferred by God, or both. The early church wasn't sure how to explain how and when Jesus Christ became the Son of God. But overall, the biblical witness keeps returning to his identification with God, the Father, and pre-existent status as Son of God. Thus, in AD 325, the Council of Nicaea resolved the issue for the church by declaring that Christ was both truly divine and truly human. <coughs> the doctrine of the Trinity, then, viewed the Son of God as coexisting with the Father, God the Father eternally, and taking on human form as incarnate, or incarnation, with the conception of Jesus in Mary's womb. This view was reaffirmed at the Council of Constantinople, AD 381. In Romans, and indeed most of his writings, Paul does not concern himself with Jesus' divine origins. That's not what is truly important about Jesus' identity to him. Rather, he focuses on Jesus' death, resurrection, and ongoing relationship to Christians as the risen and exalted Christ, Messiah, and Lord of the universe. Okay? And so what that means for you as interpreters, you're right to question some of, of what has been interpreted as the Son of God, what that means. That's, that's part of the, your academic work. You should think about that. And at the same time, you should recognize where do the New Testament writers end up? I mean, what is their final resting place in terms of their thinking about who Jesus was? And that's where I say it becomes very clear that Jesus Christ has an exalted status. He's not like Moses and Buddhist, Buddha and Confucius and other great religious leaders in history. He, he has a unique status above them all according to the New Testament writers. Okay, uh, I think for ethics, I'm going to skip the ethics section. You can read that on your own. Uh, I'll just say one major point is that Paul believed that what we believe about God and Christ will affect how we live our lives. If we can believe in our hearts that Jesus was raised from the dead, and we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, then that means we need to follow Him. And that's why some people don't even call themselves Christians. They call themselves followers of Christ. Because Christians sometimes just get attached to a traditional group of people who are Christian because their, their ancestors were Christians. And it's more of a cultural thing. And so some people say, well, I don't want to call myself Christian. I want to call myself a follower of Christ. Because that describes more clearly what it means to me to be a Christian. I believe in Christ, but I then follow him. Ethics is one of the ways, an ethical life is one of the ways we show that we are a follower of Christ. So how we live, how we love, how we treat other people should flow from what we say we believe about God and about Christ. We're sinners, yes. We're sinners in need of grace, yes. We cannot save ourselves, yes. But that doesn't mean that we, we shouldn't still strive to be righteous, good, loving people. In fact, Paul would say, he died, you died with Christ so that you may be raised in this life, to a new life, a life of righteousness, a life of love, a life of goodness, a life of service. And because of Paul's view of ethics, it's so clear, especially in Romans and Galatians, that's why I picked Ephesians 2.10 as the other verse for you to memorize, because it summarizes what he's teaching in those other books. For we are... God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus, okay, not at birth, but it's the new birth through faith in Christ, created in Christ Jesus, 
to do good works, to live an ethical life, to do good works. Those aren't the same, but they're connected. We live righteously, moral lives, and we do good things, which God prepared in advance for you to do. Okay, so uh, that's it about Romans. That's all I'm going to talk about Romans. Let me just show you on the, the screen here. This is a, a close-up view of Italy in the first century before Christ. Um, and there's not much to point out there. Uh, but you can see Rome where the big red dot is. And then this is a modern view of the ruins of the Roman Colosseum. Have you heard of the Colosseum? Raise your hand if you've heard of the Colosseum. A few. W what happened in the Roman Colosseum? Anybody remember? That's where, that's probably where Paul died. It's where gladiators had to fight each other and fight wild animals. It was very barbaric, very bloody. And people would come and sit in the stands and they would cheer as these, as these people were fighting each other or fighting the wild animals and being killed. Uh, it was, uh, they called them the games of Rome. Uh, but it was uh, an awful place. But you see it's now in ruins. And, but this, I got this one picture of it when I visited there a few years ago to show you. Uh, and here is uh, a picture of the Church of Paul. Okay, and uh, it just it clearly this was not in existence when Paul lived there and when Paul was killed. But this, this church was developed. And then there is St. Peter's Basilica, which is one of the largest churches in the entire world. Absolutely beautiful church. And it's, it's something we, we just don't have anything like that here in this country. In fact, in all of Asia, well, really in most of the world, it, it's hard to find any, any construction like this. Uh, but I thought you might like to see the pictures. All right, we're going to take a 10 minute break and then come back and then we're going to study the book of Philippians together. So we're going to talk about the book of Philippians as another example of Paul's teaching and also a great example of his contextualizing his message. So in your guide on page 119, is that correct, 119? The one with the diagram. Yes, okay, yes, yes. Teas uh, ago. And you see the, the, the big circle that says core, that's the core of Paul's theology that we talked about last week. And in fact, we talked about it again today in terms of what does he really believe about Jesus Christ? What does he believe about salvation? And according to this theory is that he applied the core of his teaching in different contexts. So you look around the, the diagram, you see Romans and Galatians. They were similar contexts. And the words were, that he chose were similar in writing to those two contexts. But then you have Philippians, and then 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and Philemon, and 1st Thessalonians. Each one is a different context, and so the idea of core and contingency is that the core of the teaching is applied in different contingent circumstances. Contingent means that they depend upon that city those people, their situation. But that situation is not the same as another one. And so there are different contingent circumstances and situations. And so, last week we talked about the core of his theology about God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the, and the Christian Church. And we just got finished talking about Romans and, and how he expressed his message there. But now we're going to talk about Philippians. And what I want you to see is that this is a very different context. And the words that he uses are different from what he uses in Romans. Does this mean that Paul changed his mind? No. It means that he took what he believed, but he found different ways to express it so that his his readers would understand it in a different context.
That's what contextualizing means. That's what, what you're supposed to learn to do. So when you go back to your villages or you go out and serve on the mission field, you find ways not to change your theology, but to express your theology so that it may be understood better by the people to whom you're talking. Okay, very important to you. Okay, now let's go to your notes. Uh, we have here the map, just to remind you of, of Macedonia on, on Paul's second missionary trip. He's over there in Troas and he gets this vision, Acts chapter 16, where the man from Macedonia says, come over to us, come over to us. And he interpreted that as a vision from God saying that he should bring the gospel across the Aegean Sea to Thessalonica and Philippi, and then he worked his way down. Okay, so right now we're just looking at, at the letter he wrote to the Philippians after he went there and founded the church. Paragraph number one. Philippians provides an example of how a different context prompted Paul to use different theological metaphors and language in speaking of the gospel and of the Christian life. Instead of using the justification language that we find in Romans, he talks about Christian identity as citizens of heaven. All right. Uh, okay. 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 Let's say ciao. Let's say ciao. Okay. That's my favorite number, ciao. <laughs> okay, all right. Philippians provides an example of how a different context prompted Paul to use different theological metaphors and language in speaking of the gospel and of the Christian life. Instead of using justification language that we find in Romans, he talks about Christian identity as citizens of heaven. Instead of talking about life in the Spirit, as he does in Romans and Galatians, he talks about having the mind of Christ and the active presence of God at work in our lives. Okay, so these are the same belief, but different language. So as theological students, you need to, to learn his different, lang different languages and recognize that his beliefs have not changed. But he's finding new ways to say the same kind of thing. What is that same thing? God loves us. We have a relationship with God. It changes our identity. And it changes how we live our lives. That's the simple message. So that's, that's not complicated, is it? But that's your job. Okay, as students, you know, study the complexity, but then boil it down to a simplicity so that you can explain to other people in different contexts what the Christian gospel is about, what the teaching of Paul and others is. Okay, so now, the Philippi context. In the mid-first century, there was a Christian church in Philippi located in modern-day Greece. The city was a Roman colony, which meant that many foreign, former Roman soldiers would have settled there alongside the Greeks. Thus, it was a multiracial and cultural melting pot. As a Roman colony, its citizens had the same rights and privileges of those in Rome. No doubt, the Philippians knew what it meant to be true to Rome and to be faithful citizens of a Roman colony. Paul seems to want them to take that same principle of good citizenship and apply it to their identity as citizens of heaven. Okay? So, so let me just contextualize that for you here. So you, do you know what it means? You know what it means to be a citizen of a country, right? Yes. And so, if I wanted to write a letter to the Bama people, who are all citizens, I could probably use language about being a citizen. 
I would say, well, you know what it means to be a good citizen of Myanmar, right? They would say yes. Okay, now let me tell you about what it means to be a citizen of heaven. That's what Paul's doing. He's starting with a concept they already knew from the secular context, and he's applying it to the spiritual context. He doesn't do that in, the, in his other letters, but in this one letter he does. So it's a very interesting approach and very, very useful, apparently, for these people. All right, purpose of the letter. The Apostle Paul founded the church in Philippi and loved the people there. His letter to them reveals his close relationship to them as well as his deep concern for their spiritual well-being. The Philippian Christians are scared because the non-Christians in their city appear to be trying to intimidate them. Instead of uniting to stand firm together, they are starting to turn against one another and they think only of their own individual interests. They've lost their spiritual footing and perspective. They need help and encouragement. Through sharing from his own personal experience, providing strong teaching, and presenting role models to imitate, Paul gives them what they need. He shows them how to handle their present challenges and how to move forward as a church in the midst of a very difficult situation. The whole letter for the Philippians is a guide to standing firm in our faith together so that we may experience the full joy that comes from living in God's will and from serving Christ effectively. Relevance for studying New Testament theology. In Philippians, Paul does not use justification language to talk about the gospel. He does not talk about Christ's sacrificial death or about living by the Holy Spirit. Instead, he draws on political and military language to address very practical, occasional concerns in Philippi. Their fear, disunity, selfishness, anxiety, and need to focus their minds on Christ and the work of the gospel. Thus, Philippians is a letter that is crafted by the needs of the congregation, seen not only in the subject matter, but in the choice of words and metaphors and theological language. Paul does not write a theological treatise, but his letter is nonetheless full of theology. In particular, we see the following. One, Paul believed that God is actively involved in the lives of believers. God gives them an ability to believe, to experience God's power and love, to want to do the will of God, and to do the will of God, and to experience supernatural peace, and to trust God. He's saying that I always pray for you with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So you see, see that? That's Paul. It's a promise. He's promising them that the work God began in them will be completed one day. What is the work that he began in them, do you think? What work did God begin among the Philippians? Good work. Well, it could be that, that they're doing good works. But here, he's not talking about their work. He's talking about God's work in them. So I think it means God's work of giving them faith in Christ, of bringing them into the family of God through faith in Christ. Remember Ephesians 2.10, he says, for we are God's workmanship, God's work, or God's handiwork, some translations say. In other words, when God reaches out to you with his Holy Spirit, he begins a work, a good work, in you. That good work is, he changes how you think. He changes your heart. He gives you an ability to believe. It's faith. 
That's what we read about in Romans, right? It's that word of God that's powerful, that touches your life and changes you. That's the good work God began in you. That good work will be completed. What does that mean? Well, it can mean a couple different things. One is, you know that, that, that you have faith in Christ. But you also know that you're still a sinner, right? You're imperfect. You haven't been sanctified. You haven't been made holy. Holy in God's eyes, but in, in real life, there's still a lot of imperfection in you and in me. And so, part of Paul's theology is that in this life of trouble and suffering, God is purifying us so that He can make us pure and blameless in the eyes of God. So on one hand, it happens immediately through the gift of God. But on the other hand, it's something that happens over time through the work of God in your life. So I think that's what he's referring to here. The good work that began with the preaching of the gospel that, that touched their life, changed their life, will be completed. It will be continue to expand in their life and changing them more and more. Now some people do believe that uh, Paul is also talking about the work they're doing to further the gospel, which is their good work. So it's not what you were saying. It, 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 it can also be their good work. But I think it's first God's work in them. Secondly, it's their work among the other people spreading the gospel. All right, let me give you another verse that talks about where Paul talks about God being at work in them. Okay, Philipp uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. He says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Okay. So, do you, do you hear that double message? On one hand, he says, you have to work out your salvation. And with fear and trembling. Why? Because God is at work in you. If you recognize that God is present, you'll have respect for that. You'll, you'll have a holy fear because you recognize the almighty God of the universe is present in you. And that should cause humility and respect. But so what Paul is saying two things here with this. One is God's presence means he's at work in you, giving you an ability to want to do God's will. I'm going to put you on the spot. How many of you would say that you want to do God's will? That in your heart you would like to do God's will? Raise your hand. Ah, there's quite a few of you. Okay? <laughs> I'm hoping for everybody at some point. Um, Paul says your desire to want to do God's will came from God. So some of you, I think, are, are probably very critical of yourself. Some of you judge yourself harshly. Some of you maybe need to judge yourself more harshly. But others of you judge yourself too harshly. That's human nature. But if you're one of those that judges yourself harshly, just remember that your desire to want to please God is a sign that God's already at work in your life. So praise God for that. Take encouragement from that. He's, he's already put the desire in your heart. And Paul says he also will give you an ability to serve him and to please him. That's great news. But that's not a call to be passive. We're still called to be active. And, and one of the things we're going to say about Paul over and over again is there's, there's a balance between our activity and, our, and God's activity. God takes the initiative. 
God sends his son to die for us while we're still sinners. God puts his spirit in us. God changes our mind and our heart. This is all the good work of God in you. But God still expects you to respond with gratitude. Respond with obedience. Respond with submission. Respond with repentance. Respond with service. That's the balanced presentation of Paul's gospel. All other gospels are a distortion. There are some who preach a gospel that just emphasize the grace of God and neglect the works of humanity. That's not Paul. That's not Paul. There are others that emphasize the works of humanity and minimize the works of God. That's not Paul. That's, that's humanism and human effort. Paul has both a strong, strong place for the work of God and a strong place for human response. They have to be together. Okay, that's point number one. Point number two is that Paul is confident that God will provide salvation after death. All right, this is, this is a part of his theology. Look at chapter 1, verse 23. Paul is struggling with, with should he go on living or should he die? He says in verse 23, I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it's more necessary for you that I remain in the body. So, in other words, he believed that when he leaves this worth, this, excuse me, when he leaves this life, he's going to go and be with Christ. All right? So, some people believe that when this life ends, there's nothing. Uh, Paul believed that when this life ends, that he would go and be with Christ. All right? By the way, this is another, to me, important point of, of comparison or contrast to Buddhism. What happens to someone after they're enlightened? Which I said, told you before, almost never happens. But if you are enlightened, you go to nirvana. What is nirvana? Emptiness, it's, it's bliss, but it's, it's nothing. You are absorbed into the universe. The, the most important points of contrast for me between Christianity and Buddhism is that Christianity is relational forever. We don't just get absorbed into a force field of the universe. We have a relationship with God that goes on for eternity. That relationship of love sustains me now. The relationship after I die, I look forward to, gives me hope as I pass through the valley of the shadow of death. So that one day I will be with my Lord Jesus Christ in heaven. That's the Christian gospel. Now look at chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Here Paul says, Our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Now, if you want, you could write in the margin 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15 is where Paul talks about the same concept, but in more detail. Uh, so you can add that to your notes if you want. 1 Corinthians 15. But here he's just talking about the hope he has. He says, we have a Savior who's coming from heaven. You know, remember, we're citizens of heaven, according to Paul. And now we have a Savior who's coming from, our, from heaven to save us and to transform our bodies. And so Paul is confident that there is a salvation ahead of time. At the same time, and, and I've already said this a little bit, believers have the responsibility to exercise their heavenly citizenship worthily of the gospel and to work out their salvation with fear and trembling. Well, I already said the second point, but let's, let's look at chapter 1, verses 27 through 30. And th this, by the way, this is the first imperative of the whole letter. The first time he tells them, this is what you must do. So this is a very important set of verses in this letter. 
So Paul says, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him, since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now you hear that I still have. All right, so this concept is, is a little bit um, difficult to explain unless you've had Greek. But here in, in your English Bibles, he says, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel. The Greek word is politeuista. Okay, politeuista. Don't worry. You don't, you don't have to write that down. But I want you to hear in that politeuista is, is built on the word polis. Did you learn that Greek word polis is the Greek word for city? Did you ever hear that before? No. Okay, so polis is Greek for city. Politeuista means exercise your citizenship as a member of a Greek city. You see, this word is hardly ever used in the rest of the New Testament. I'm telling you because it's a, an example of contextualizing. I, th I believe Paul chose this verb because he wanted to emphasize their citizenship. As I told you earlier, they're citizens of Rome and they know what it means to live as a citizen of Rome. So in this letter, while they're afraid of persecution, they're afraid of people who are opposing them, they're afraid of suffering, they're fighting with each other. He says, listen, you're a citizen, not just of Rome, you're a citizen of heaven. You're a citizen of heaven. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to think that, that those who are trying to persecute you, that they're going to win. They think they're going to win. They think they're going to destroy you. But they're not. Yes, you might die. But even if you die, they can't win. Because your life is protected in Christ. And so for eternity, you will be with Christ. And someday... If before you die, uh, the end of time comes, Christ is coming back from heaven. So heaven parallels Rome. So instead of coming from Rome, instead of the emperor coming from Rome, Christ is coming from heaven for his people. It's going to change their bodies and give them an eternity in relationship with him. That's Paul's theology. That's Paul's belief. So... What they think about who they are is really important. Now, could this have relevance for Christians in Myanmar? Could this concept be relevant here? I think so. I think so. Because you, you know, at least you're not Rohingya, okay, who have no citizenship. But as Christians, you do have citizenship. But you're also a minority. Most of you, if not all of you, are from the minority groups. And you may feel like second-class citizens. Historically, there's been persecution, right? Against some Christians, or discrimination, or mistreatment. So I'm not talking about the present, I'm talking about historically. There have been issues that may make you wonder about your status, your identity, your future. So what we have here in Philippians is a call to recognize that no matter how you may be treated or viewed by the majority group around you, in God's eyes, you're citizens of heaven. You have a Savior. You have a Lord. 
and you owe your allegiance to him and he will care for you and he will continue to work in you for good and you have good works for you to do in the meantime. How we view ourselves in our head and what we believe in our hearts is very important to the Apostle Paul because he knows that will affect your whole life. And that's how you're going to get strength in the midst of your adversity and struggles. Okay. Uh, point number four. Not to talk about soteriology, but to provide an example of sacrificial service and of God's faithfulness to those who obey Him. So let's read this. This, this is a very famous passage that I trust you've read before. But it's called the Christ Hymn. I'll begin in verse 5, which is the introduction. Paul says, Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So this hymn is about Jesus, but it's also trying to teach us about the kind of hope that you and I can have. If you wanted to draw a chart, or, or should I say a diagram of the movement, we can say up here is heaven and Christ descends to earth, right? He humbles himself. He takes the, the lowest position of a humble servant. In fact, it's so humble, he even submits to death on a cross, which was a great disgrace in ancient Rome, to be crucified on a cross with criminals. He takes the lowest place. But what does God do? God raises him from the dead and exalts him to the highest place. So do you think this is a, a story just about Jesus? No. It's a story to give you and me hope in the midst of our suffering and persecution and difficulty. Now, you and I didn't start up here in heaven. We're not the sons of God and daughters of God like Jesus. Some of you even may say, I started, you started at the very bottom. But whether you start here or here or here, or you at the very bottom, the hope for those who put their faith in God and in Christ is that you will be lifted up to a place of resurrection, of, 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 of a new creation, a new body, a new destiny, a new eternity. That's, that's part of the gospel according to Paul. At the beginning of that, the ethical part of that, that's verse 5 where he says, have the same mind in you that was in Christ. That just means it's not our job to exalt ourselves to this highest place. Jesus shows us by his example that he humbled himself to the lower place. We have to let God raise us up. We don't raise ourselves up. That's prideful. And as I said before, pride is the number one sin. Pride causes many other sins. Pride is what causes conflict between us. No, the Christian way is a way of humility. But we trust in a God who will exalt us when the time is right. So meanwhile, our attitude towards one another should be one of humility. I'm here to serve you. I, I mean that not just as a principle, but I, I see that. I'm a teacher. When I, when I tell the people in, in the United States where I'm going, I say I'm going Myanmar to serve. I'm here to serve my students. So I'm not above my students as a teacher. I, I have more knowledge because of my education. 
So that's why I'm talking. <laughs> I'm talking with the knowledge. But my talking is for service. So that you're, you may rise up more through my service. Okay, point number five. Paul describes the gospel as personal and life transforming rather than doctrinal or forensic. Now forensic is a, is a, a difficult term in, in English. It just means a legal declaration of our justification by the decree and work of God. So that's, that's what you'll find in your commentaries in Rome about Romans. They'll talk about forensic justification. That means we're justified God, uh, we're justified to God in a legal sort of way. Not because we really are righteous, but because God declares us righteous. That's the forensic justification. But as I said, Paul doesn't talk that way in Philippians. Apparently it's not important. It's not valuable to the Philippians to talk about forensic justification. Instead, he talks about citizenship and identity and relationship. So he contrasts what may be gained by human accomplishments or heredity to what can only be gained by a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Thus, his highest value is to know Christ and the power of his resurrection in this life as well as the next. Here is just a beautiful, beautiful passage. In Roman, excuse me, in Philippians chapter 3, he says, you know, whatever I can whatever was I considered my gain in the past, I now consider loss. Right? Whatever, whatever is in the past, I forget about that. He's not talking about his failures, he's talking about his successes. He forgets about his success, forget about his achievements. Why? Because there's one thing that really matters to Paul, according to Philippians. And let's read it. We'll start in verse 7. He says, chapter 3, verse 7. Whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Now, don't think that Paul means that he's going to earn his resurrection from the dead. You can't do that. But what he means is he, he wants to so identify with Christ, the Christ who was in heaven, who humbled himself and took this lowest place, who was then resurrected by God and has taken now the highest place. This Christ, he says, I want to so identify with Christ that that Christ takes me by his power with him to this exalted place. Do you see how alive Paul's theology is? How dynamic it is? It's not just ideas for the head. It, it's, a, it's a living relationship with God through Christ, through the Holy Spirit that changes the mind, that changes the heart, that changes the behavior. It's all-encompassing. Paul is not a Sunday Christian, right? Christian on Sunday and, and a, a heathen on Monday, right? He's a Christian every day because he doesn't know any other kind of Christianity. There's only one kind, and that's one that's all-encompassing, life-changing. That's what he's teaching the Philippians. Okay, finally, number six. Paul's teaching for practical daily living includes learning to focus on God and to trust in God always, especially in the midst of fears, dangers, and needs. Instead of speaking much about the Holy Spirit, as he does in Romans and Galatians, he teaches that no one can experience peace from God. Uh, no, excuse me. He teaches that one can experience peace from God that transcends all understanding. Remember, peace 
is one of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. But he doesn't say that here. It just talks about peace and joy. One, one can also learn to become self-sufficient through Christ who enables us to do all things we are required to do. Let's look then quickly at, at Philippians 4, 4 through 7. Again, very famous verses. Here Paul says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And then drop down to verse 13. Uh, I'll start at verse 12. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Different words than Galatians and in Romans, but same idea. A relationship with God is life-changing. A relationship with God allows us to experience peace and joy and strength so that we can do the will of God. We can do good in the world. Our theme this year is growing in Christ, preparing for service. And this is a good time to say, based on Paul's theology, that it's so important that as you think about going out into the world to make the world a better place, which I hope is your vision and your, and your dream, that Paul says the only way you can really do that is if you do it through the power of God. And, it, and the only way you can do it through the power of God is if you have a relationship with God in Christ. Right? So you can't separate, in Paul's mind, you can't separate a relationship with God and the good works that you're called to do. They both they belong together, and you have to keep developing both your relationship with God and your ability to serve at the same time. And that's a lifelong calling. Okay, that's Philippians. I want you to talk in your small group about what aspects of Paul's theology, as you saw in Romans and Philippians, that seem particularly relevant to you for your understanding about God and, and your understanding about Christian living. Okay, so I want you to talk about what you heard this morning and what you read in the guide. And then after you've done that for maybe 10 minutes, then I want you to come up with a question that, that you have for me stemming from today's lectures. So on Romans and Philippians. So please don't ask about Jesus and James or Revelation, just about Romans and Philippians today. Okay? Nalela? Okay, so please. Go to your small groups and and uh, and then as soon as your group has a question, come up here and I'll, I'll write it on the screen. So, so very good questions. So you're doing a very good job discussing and coming up with questions. Question number one: In Romans, what does work mean? Good works or work of the law? For most of Romans. Works refer to works of the law. And so he's contrasting, uh, attempting to achieve salvation by following the works of the law as opposed to trusting in God's promises and putting your faith in God's promises. So in Romans, uh, that's, that's what he's talking about most of the time. He does not talk a lot about good works. Um, but when we get to Romans chapter 12, he talks about how we are all called to live lives of love. And so good works flow from what he says in chapter, uh, especially in chapter 12, uh, about uh, we, can, we can think about good works there. 
Uh, okay. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 2, 8, 9, and 10, when he says, you're saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works. He means works of the law. It's not by, by observing the law or even doing good deeds. But then 10, we're God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. So the issue is, is not are, are good works relevant or not, but where, what is the right place for works? All right, but, but I'll come back to that with, with another question here in a minute. Uh, but, but for question number two, I already answered that. Uh, question number one, I answered that. Question number two, why did not Paul talk about salvation in the book of Philippians? He did talk about salvation. Right? He, it is, he did talk about salvation. He didn't talk about justification. That's the difference. So salvation is everywhere in Paul's letters. It's just that in Romans and Galatians, salvation means justification. In Corinthians, in First Corinthians, uh, he talks in First Corinthians chapter five. He talks about reconciliation, uh, but it's still about salvation. In Philippians, it's more about God's work in us, saving us, and making us citizens of heaven. And so it's relational, it changes our identity, but it's still salvation. We're waiting for, he says in, in chapter 3, verse 20, we're waiting for a Savior. But what does a Savior do? A Savior brings salvation. All right, so salvation is important, Philippians. Number three, how should we respond to Paul's idea of heavenly citizenship in a Myanmar context? And another group said, or asked, how can we become good citizens in a Myanmar context? Well, we need to add to whatever Paul says in Philippians, what he says in Romans chapter 13. Romans 13 is his classic passage where he says that Christians are called to submit to the ruling authorities. So we can say that according to Paul, he believed that your primary identity is that you're a citizen of heaven. Once you become a Christian, your Lord is now Jesus Christ, not the emperor, okay, not the ruler of a, of a secular nation. Your first ruler, your first allegiance, your, your first obligation is to your heavenly Lord, who is Jesus Christ. But, as a citizen of heaven, you still are called to live in this world. And how do you live in this world? You do so by being a good citizen in a secular sense. Are there any exceptions? Yes. If the secular government asks you to do something that violates your commitment to Jesus Christ, then you can draw a line. Paul does not discuss that, though, in Romans 13. And so Romans 13 is much discussed and debated because he doesn't, he doesn't talk about exceptions. And so usually when students talk about Romans 13, they say, well, what about an unjust government? What if the government is oppressive? Uh, what if they're evil? You know, what if they're hurting us? But well, Paul doesn't talk about that. That's not his point. Uh, so I'm sorry. But our job in New Testament theology is first of all to understand what did Paul say and what did he not say. Because that's our foundation. And then we can ask questions. Like all our questions we should ask. But not every question has an answer from Paul. So where there's no answer from Paul... Then we can, we can theologize ourselves. We can think about it. But we need to know the difference between what does Paul say and what do we say. And then we have to uh, come up with a, an application of Paul's teaching that, that we think is appropriate. So another way of saying that is what Paul, I think, would say to you is 
Remember, first of all, you're a citizen of heaven. Follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And while you're on earth, be a good citizen here. Follow the rules, follow the laws, pay your taxes, do what you're supposed to do. Don't live in rebellion. That, that is not appropriate for Christians. Uh, but if there are other issues, such as being violated, you're being violated or, or, or oppressed, that's a different discussion. Okay, number four. How can we explain the concept of sinners to those of other religions? Are we sinners because of Adam? Okay, this is also debated. This, is, this discussion usually focuses on Romans chapter 5, where Paul talks about Adam being the first man and, and Christ being the new Adam. And, we, and sin came into the world through the first man, Adam, and we were delivered from sin through the second man, second Adam, Jesus Christ. That's his argument in chapter 5. The debate is, is he really teaching that everyone is a sinner? That, that you were born as a sinner? And that's the idea of original sin. Sin came into the world, you're born in sin, and so you were all destined to die because of Adam's sin. My answer to that is, I don't believe there's enough in that text to warrant that conclusion. It's, it's, it's debated, but I, I don't think it's, a, it's a, a good translation of the text and a good interpretation of the text. And I would say in the end, it doesn't matter. Because whether or not you were born in sin or not born in sin, are you a sinner? Raise your hand if you think you are a sinner. Not because of Adam, but because of you. Raise your hand. Okay. That, I think that answers the question. Right? So don't worry about Adam. You have your own sin that makes you a sinner. Okay? So that's my answer. Uh, why did Paul write the letter to the Romans? Okay, now this is... This is not so much for this class, that's for introduction to New Testament. Okay, but, but there are different ideas about why he wrote the letter. Some people think he was trying to raise money so that he could get money to go for his fourth missionary trip to Spain. Uh, I think he was. But that's clearly not the only reason. That's one reason. He also wrote the letter to explain in a very extended way what his theology was, what he believed, and why he believed this gospel message needed to go to Spain and all over the world. So that's very important for us to realize. Paul is not just writing theology for Christians. He's also explaining why his gospel is needed by non-Christians. And so thus he becomes uh, the, the spokesperson for a gospel mission. Now this is, this is very relevant in our MIT context. Because I think most of you, when you came to MIT, I think the word mission meant gospel mission, right? Is that true? Yes? No? Yes. But when you come here, you hear a lot about social mission, economic development, right? So, so now is a good time for me to say, you don't have to choose between those two missions. But please don't change the meaning of mission completely. Because you go home and talk about mission, but then you mean something else. You will surely confuse everybody. Okay? Because they think mission is gospel mission. And don't do a gospel mission, but really do something else. If it's gospel mission, then do gospel. If it's social mission, do social. If it's development, do development. But what's, what's a little bit unclear here at MIT, in my opinion, is that the, the, the definition of mission changes to development by some and then by others to interfaith dialogue. Well, those are missions, true. But they're not all of the mission. 
And they're certainly not the mission that Paul was talking about. So don't forget about what Paul teaches while you are learning some new, new applications of mission. Okay, uh, what were the issues related to being a good citizen in Philippi? Uh, I think the main issue that I'm aware of is just allegiance. Do you know that English word, allegiance? In America, we put our hands on our heart and say, I pledge allegiance to the flag and the United States of America. Right? Allegiance means I will defend and support my country. And so the emperor wanted people to have allegiance to him, to Rome. And so the issue of being a good citizen is, would you in fact pledge allegiance to the, the emperor so that there's no competition between Rome and somebody else or some other entity. All right, this became a, an issue for Christians because our Lord is Jesus Christ. And so there was something that developed called the emperor worship or emperor religion, imperial uh, worship or religion in the first century. And that's where citizens were required to to maybe pour out a, 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 a drink, like wine or some kind of a, of a drink, they call it a libation, an offering, or drink it, to express their allegiance to the emperor. Christians would refuse to do that because our primary allegiance is to Christ. And so sometimes Christians were persecuted because they would, they would not be good citizens in that sense. But when Paul talks about citizenship in Romans 13, I think he's mostly talking about obeying the laws and paying taxes. Um, so uh, I think that's, that's all I can say about that. According to Romans 13.1, I, I think I talked about question 7 already. Can we be saved if we only believe in Jesus Christ without practicing it in action? Okay, this is... This is an important theological question that every one of you needs to know the answer to. So, let me ask you. Okay, you have two choices. Three, all right. Yes, no, or I don't know. Okay, so the question is, can you be saved just by grace through faith without any action on your part? No good deeds, no ethics, no righteousness. You just, you just believe and you're saved and forgiven. So how many say, yes, that's enough? Raise your hand. Okay, we've got several. How many of you say, no, there has to be either good works or there has to be repentance and there has to be righteousness as well as faith? Raise your hand. Oh, that's the majority. How many of you would say, I don't really know? Okay, all right, all right, good. I, I think you should struggle with this question, honestly. Because the Apostle Paul, I think if you step back, what I mean, instead of just looking at one verse or two verses, you step back and look at the, all of Paul's teaching, I think the answer is pretty clear. But when you focus on just one or two verses, it might be confusing. So, what do I think the big picture is? That we are saved by grace through faith alone, but faith that saves does not come alone. It comes with works. All right? That's a classic Reformed statement to explain this dilemma, this, this confusion. Do you understand the English? We're saved by grace through faith alone. That means nothing else. But this salvation that comes by faith does not come alone. That means when you receive the salvation, it comes with something else besides salvation. What is that something else? The Holy Spirit. The power of God to change your life. To do what's good. And to do good. So much so that if you don't do good works, 
I question whether you ever received God's grace. You see? Now, so, fortunately, I'm not the judge. And you're not the judge. God, there's only one judge. All right? But we have to try to understand the message. And Paul's message, when he was debating with the, the Jewish people, or the Judaizers, who preached faith plus works, he said, no, not works, not works of the law. But he assumed, of course there'll be good works though. There'll always be good deeds. How can you be a follower of God and not do good deeds, right? To him it would be absurd to, to, to think that you can't do good things. You shouldn't and won't. And in fact, in Romans 6, he talks about you were buried with Christ and raised with Christ to live a new life. In Romans chapter 8, beautiful passage on life in the Spirit. In Romans 7, he says we're prisoners to sin. But he says in Romans 8, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. All right, there's grace, salvation by grace through faith in Christ. I think this is going out. But then the whole, the whole rest of chapter 8 talks about a new life in the Holy Spirit. In Galatians chapter 5, he talks about the deeds of the sinful flesh are obvious. The same things he wrote about in Romans chapter 1. But he says the fruit of the Spirit it's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. In other words, those who are saved by grace through faith are given the Spirit, and the Spirit produces good things. If there's no good things in your life, Paul might say, I'm not sure Christ is in your life. Okay, so, what does that mean practically? As a preacher and teacher, I think sometimes you're going to need to preach to people in your church who are weary, guilty, ashamed, and tell them, I've got good news for you. You're saved by grace through faith. You're forgiven. Be free. Rejoice. Be glad. And then there are the, the lazy, the rebellious, you know, the, the, the people who are, who are, who are who care nothing about righteousness, care nothing about doing good or contributing, you need to give them a different message. You, you don't change your gospel, but you tell them, listen, Christianity is about following Christ. And about following Christ is about repentance and about doing good. So repent and do good. All right, so you need to have both messages in here and, your, and in here in your mouth. And be ready to say the message that needs to be preached to the people who need to hear it. When they need to hear it. Um, okay, now question nine. According to Romans 6.23, the consequence of death is sin. Is there more judgment after this punishment? Uh, yes. What Paul says in 1 Corinthians is that we will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So there is the judgment on the human race, which is death. But there, we're also going to be judged according to works. And when we, in other words, there's going to be reward and there's going to be judgment. So we have 1 Corinthians chapter 3, chapter 10, talks about judgment according to works. It's not about salvation, but it's about judgment. Accountability. How can believers demonstrate the work of the Holy Spirit in them? What do you think? By using your spiritual gift? By serving Christ in the church? By asking God to work through you to bless the lives of other people? That means you will help them come to faith in Christ. You will bring them encouragement. You will give them a word of counsel or teaching. Uh, you will improve their life in some way. You will help, help improve You'll work for their well-being in some, some fashion. These are the ways the Holy Spirit prompts us to, to help other people. We also demonstrate the work of the Spirit through the fruit of the Spirit that I mentioned a moment ago. Galatians 5.22 uh, 
Is a white lie a sin? <laughs> well, what do you think? Yes. Yes, I think so. Um, when we try to defend our actions, that should be a warning to us that something's wrong. Because when you're trying to defend yourself, it's like, well, it was only a white lie. Well, were you deceiving that person? Why were you deceiving that person? Okay, so deception is the same as a lie. That's what I was taught as a boy. I think it's right. Deception is the same as a lie. So if I do something or act in a way that gets you to believe something that I know isn't true, it's the same as a lie. So don't do it. <laughs> is salvation by grace alone? We already talked about that. If salvation is by grace through faith, do we still need to teach about ethics? Well, I just explained that. Yes or no? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Does God solve our problems according to Romans? Yes. Yes. Okay. He solves our biggest problem, our sin problem, by offering forgiveness and by giving us this Holy Spirit to help us overcome temptation. Those are the problems He solves. Does He promise to rescue us from all evil and from all danger? No. He does not. Okay, Romans chapter 8. Paul says, I'm convinced that neither death nor life will separate us from the love of God. So he says, death is coming to all of us. Suffering comes to all of us. But we're not going to be delivered from that, but, but we won't be separated from the love of God. Uh, can non-Christians be saved without abandoning their form of religion? This is a much debated question. And probably belongs in theology and missiology. So, uh, but, but, so what would Paul say? Paul would say that if your form of religion was full of idols, then yes, of course you should abandon them. What, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, he says, you know, what, what, what does Christ have to do with those beliefs and idols that, have, that are, are based on lies? And so this is a tricky question, especially in, in Myanmar, especially in theology today. And you're going to deal with that issue in your contextual theology class. What about, was God at work in your tribe, tribal religions before the missionaries came? It's a really good question. Paul doesn't really answer that. But Paul believes that, that the message of Christ is a new message, a needed message. So, my question to you is, if you have Christ, why do you need to go back to the old religions? And, and it somehow contradicts Christ that I'd say, why go backwards, go forwards? Uh, but again, I know that's a bigger subject than, than I can talk about in two minutes. Uh, already talked about 16, about the original sin, 17. Um, it, okay, I love the word. It, is Paul's description of citizens heaven like feeding medicine to a dying man in a hopeless situation? Or is it like giving him comfort? So in other words, I guess, is it really fixing his problem or just making him feel better? Uh, well, I think Paul would say it's, it's, it should do both. To know that we're citizens of heaven through faith in Christ does bring us comfort in the face of suffering. But it also gives us real hope. The hope is for the next life and somewhat for this life, but not just for this life. Uh, Romans, what is unity in Christ with Jews and Gentiles? I'm going to save that until Saturday. By the way, don't forget we meet Saturday. What time? Five to eight. Five o'clock to eight o'clock here on Saturday. So when we talk about Ephesians, we're going to talk about the unity of Jews and Gentiles. What was Paul's most important message in his letter to the Romans? I think it's simply salvation by grace through faith. That we're sinners, we can't save ourselves, but God provided salvation through Jesus Christ. I think that's his most important message. Is there any way to be forgiven apart from grace, the grace of God? Paul doesn't know anyway. 
Paul only preaches a gospel that says that forgiveness comes by the grace of God. I think the issue for us as theologians is can God offer grace to people who don't know Jesus? I think that's the question we should be discussing. Not is there forgiveness without grace? No. There is no forgiveness without grace. In fact, forgiveness really is grace. Because forgiveness really is never earned. What does it mean that God gave them up to depravity? I'm going really fast because we're late here. I can't leave out Eve, right? All right, so Eve. Welcome, okay. <laughs> Adam and Eve. But I created them to be in, in relationship with me. But what happened? Adam and Eve chose to sin. Right? They chose to sin. And, and so they decided to, to step out of, well, they were driven out of the Garden of Eden. But the, the metaphor is they, they, they stepped out of fellowship with God to enter into the ways of the world. And so when it says that God gave them over to a depraved mind, it, it is when they chose to sin, what God said is, okay, you, you can go. You can go. Go. And he let them go. And when humans go on their own away from God, their minds become depraved. They deteriorate spiritually, morally, ethically. In fact, that's what we can see as, as a human, human race is this, this expansion of human evil that comes about because God let us go. So gave them over means he let us go in the way of our own and in our own way, in our own way we became corrupt and more corrupt. And we find in Paul's teaching a warning against following the desires of our corrupted nature, he says. That we'll see that in Ephesians next week. And this is something you should take very, very seriously. Why? Because it, it functions on two levels. Today we only emphasize the first level. That is, because of the corruption of the human race, you, we are all sinners in need of God's grace and forgiveness, which he offers to us. The Holy Spirit helps to counterbalance that corruption by help, teaching us, sanctifying us, and helping us to become new people. But there's still in us that old flesh which is corrupted and continues to be corrupted. So now I'm talking on a practical, ethical level. You need to be very careful. As you go out into the world, you still can be corrupted more. All right? So from my message this morning, you might, you might think, oh, okay, bad news. I'm a sinner. Good news, I'm forgiven. So good news, bad news, good news. And so, PB, we're finished, right? I'm good to go. But Paul really doesn't believe that. That yes, yes, but then he says, now watch out. Because as you go forward in the grace of God, you still can be corrupted. And that's what, and, and whatever, however evil you think you are now, it can get worse. It can get worse. And I pray that you, it doesn't get worse for you, but I have to warn you that it could get worse and worse and worse for you. And we see that sometimes, right? And so that's why now is the time to first of all be grateful to admit your sinfulness, Paul says. Be grateful to accept Christ as your Savior so that you may be forgiven. Receive the Holy Spirit that you may have new power. And then commit yourself to follow the ways of Christ so that you don't continue in your corruption. Okay. All right. Now I have to let you go because it's late, and you're hungry, and you have other things to do. The last question, very big question. I can't possibly answer in one minute. Um, but I think we'll have other opportunities to talk about that subject. Um, and so please, the group that brought that up, I think it was over here, bring it up again, okay? So, because uh, 
it's an important one for us to talk about in our context. Okay, receive now the benediction. Now may the God of grace, who loved us and by his great love for us, gave us eternal encouragement and good hope in Jesus Christ. May he encourage your hearts, fill you with gratefulness, joy, and peace through his forgiveness, and also motivate you to follow Christ obediently, that you may not become more corrupt, but that you may become more holy, useful for every good work. Amen.